Hi, welcome to how to borrow, buy, bulletproof, and beautify your home. Uh, I'm Gary Wong, and I will be the first one to introduce Jordan, who will be our first speaker. Uh, just a little bit about Jordan. She is my preferred mortgage professional. She is a high performance mortgage professional that has access to a lot of creative financing options. Uh, I highly recommend you to talk with her if you um, are always finding it hard to get money or um, if you have a like um, if you're self-employed or you have a little bit complicated financing situation definitely talk with her so uh, without further ado I will hand the mic over to Jordan thanks everybody for coming tonight such a pleasure to have you and to be able to speak here uh, for you and hopefully I can uh, provide you with some great information that you can either use for yourselves or for your clients. Um, I'm Jordan Thompson. Uh, I've been a mortgage broker for approximately six years. Prior to that, um, I've had a couple of businesses and I worked in the big bank for uh, just about seven years. <clears throat> I'm also a member of the Mortgage Brokers Institute of BC, as well as Mortgage Professionals Canada. So I'm a licensed mortgage broker, which differentiates me from those that work in the bank who are not licensed. So tonight I wanted to talk to you guys about when the banks say no, show me the money. It's getting a little bit tougher to get money these days, um, but there's definitely money to be had. And so these are some of the solutions that we can come up with. So firstly, why is it so hard to get mortgage financing? Why is it harder to get money these days? Well, first off, uh, the stress test. I'm sure you've all heard of the stress test. We've had the stress test on insured mortgages uh, since uh, 2016. And then in January of 2018, uh, conventional mortgage financing. So those mortgages with 20% down or more um, were also stress tested. So now all mortgages, uh, mortgages are stress tested. And what that means is that no matter how much down payment you have, when I qualify you or your client for a mortgage, I'm using an inflated uh, interest rate. So I'm either using the contract rate uh, which is the rate that you actually pay, plus two, or the benchmark rate, whichever is higher. So what does this actually mean? How does this break down? Well, it basically means that consumers are now qualifying for, on average, 20% less than they did prior to the stress test. I see this most when somebody's coming back, they bought a home, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, they wanna know how much they qualify for today, and they have an expectation based on their income and what they qualified for a couple of years ago. When I now tell them how much they qualify for using the stress test, they're, they're quite shocked. And what we've seen as a result is that borrowers and uh, would-be buyers are kind of holding off. Um, and I, I definitely believe it's having an impact on the real estate uh, market because people are sitting on the sidelines. They're, they're kind of waiting or they're just saying, well, I can't get anything. I can't get what I want for the amount that you're telling me I qualify for. Another reason is tighter underwriting guidelines. So there's something called the B20 rules and it has really put pressure on the all banks. Uh, and tonight we're gonna to talk definitely about the, the, the big banks. Um, and they're under a lot of scrutiny. The biggest impact I'm seeing is that there is a high documentation required. You need to prove everything. And I'm not asking for all these documents because I just feel like it. It's because the lender is requiring me to provide all these documents. And in fact, it's the lender themselves are actually under the scrutiny of the government 
the federal government who is requiring that, uh, that the lenders are really, really tight with these guidelines. So we're certainly seeing an impact that way. With these tighter guidelines, banks are no longer able to give exceptions where they used to. And what that means is that sometimes you just don't have the same options that you used to. Another big thing we're seeing and what's making it harder for so many people looking for mortgage financing is that they have out of the box income. So big banks like you to fit into certain boxes. Um, salaried is great. You've been at your job for a long time. You don't have any derogatory credit. You have a great credit score. It costs more for lenders to provide you with financing based on your credit score. So they've pushed up the required credit score for you to fit in their box. Self-employed. How many people here are self-employed or commissioned, um, contract work? Put up your hands. So a lot of us, we're all self-employed, right? So in fact, it's 15% of people in BC that are considered self-employed. And banks don't particularly like the self-employed. And the main reason is that we don't like to declare all our income. And even though we uh, banks and lenders know that the income uh, is, is most likely more than we're declaring, they need to see what you've declared. And that line 150 for all the accountants and anybody who, who knows what your T1 general looks like, the line 150 is the number that the banks want to see even though we as self-employed people tend to expense down a lot to reduce taxes. Bad credit. People think there's no way I can get a mortgage. Um, well, that's actually not true. You can, you can absolutely get a mortgage with bad credit, but just not through the bank. Corporate income. A lot of us have corporations. We retain, uh, money in our corporation, we pay ourselves uh, less, um, you know, uh, personally. And again, the banks aren't looking necessarily at that corporate income. So there are definitely so solutions for those who are retaining uh, income within their corporation and how we can use that corporate income to help boost uh, your mortgage qualifications amount. The last one is you didn't get pre-approved properly. So you went into the bank and you said, hi, Mr. Banker, I make $50,000 a year. That's what you think anyway, right? Not, not you personally, <laughs> but that's what you think. But it turns out that, well, actually, you know, I'm self-employed and this year I made 50,000, but last year I only made 10,000. And in the eyes of the lender, that isn't 50,000. You need to average that. So some people just, you know, that the, the bank representative might not take a look at all those income documents. Or maybe you're on a contract that ends in a year's time. Well, guess what? We don't get to use that income because it's not going to cover the term of a loan. So those are some of the reasons why the bank today uh, might not be able to provide you or your clients with the mortgage financing that you require. So looking beyond the bank box, as a mortgage broker, uh, I have access to dozens of lenders and they want your business. So they've, they've pushed out into a new space, a lot of, of, of lenders. So you either have the banks, the credit unions, or the non-bank lenders, also known as monoline lenders. The first alternative we're going to look at, I should say, is, is the alternative lending that will help these uh, clients or yourselves who are struggling to get just mainstream A bank lending. Now, how does this help? Well, first of all, they've got relaxed debt ratios. And simply put, that means I can use more of your income towards debt servicing your loan. So is it the, at the bank, it might only be 
42% uh, uh, of your income can go towards all your debts, total debt servicing. With alternative lending, I can go up to 50% of your income in some cases. Definitely an average between 45 to 50%. And that really helps if you've got things like um, extra debts uh, every month, fixed, fixed liabilities. There is some stigma with alternative lending. People think it's, you know, it's for, for people who just, you know, they don't have good jobs and, you know, they're just the, the, the lower of, the, of the, the population. Well, that's not true. I say shorter terms to get you in. Alternative lending is not like your five-year fixed. It's to get you in for one or two years and then get you out back into the A lending space. Things like poor credit and bankruptcy is just fine. I just did a loan where my client, it was a married couple, one client had a 500 credit score. Really low, really, really low for collections. His wife had a credit score of 700, which is a good score. However, she uh, just had a bankruptcy discharged six months earlier. So they you know, definitely did not think that they could get a mortgage. They came into an inheritance, so they had a large down payment and wanted to buy now. They were shocked when I said, I can absolutely get you a mortgage. And they just, I would say two or three weeks ago, just moved into a beautiful town home. And I was definitely able to arrange them financing because we used an alternative lender. Yes, the interest rate is slightly higher. Uh, their interest rate was, I believe it was about four and a half percent. They did pay a 1% lender fee, but they got the home that they wanted and they will have no problem once that bankruptcy is discharged for two years going back into A lending. And we were also able to use that same mortgage to rebuild the husband's credit score from 500 by providing him with credit. So uh, alternative lending can certainly do for any financial planners here who are looking for debt consolidation or credit repair. They're a great opportunity. Divorce, and it definitely happens. And sometimes you need to buy out your spouse and we need to use alternative lending to be able to use more of your income. So those relaxed debt ratios. Specialty products. Again, we can look beyond the bank. There are some lenders out there. Uh, they're coming back on the scene. They kind of pulled these <coughs> programs, but they're definitely coming back for high net worth uh, clients that have a lot of equity. So um, I'll, I'll use Manulife's. If you have a 50% down payment, I can use, uh, basically, it's not income qualifying. Yes, there are some guidelines, um, but we can take a look at those equity programs. So if you have a very large down payment, um, some high net worth, we do want some liquid assets, it can't all be tied up in real estate. That's certainly a product where if you walked into the bank, they'd say, well, that's great, you have a great down payment, you don't have the income to debt service this. Business owners with low income. So, since there are so many self-employed people here in BC, the alternative lenders and the B lending space has so many products available to us whether it's stated income, uh, whether it is uh, specialty programs where we're not gonna use that income that we see on your T1 general, which is the, the, you know, the, the tax declaration that you send to the, to the government. Um, we're gonna take a look at your bank deposits. We're going to take a look at what you're actually bringing in even though you might have declared a very small amount. So uh, other ways to prove that business income. And then finally, corporate income. So I'm running a across a lot of clients right now. Very few banks will look at the corporate income and use that as your income. But right now I have a ton of business owners um, where <laughs> I have one who declared zero dollars and the gross revenue through the business was 
two million with a net revenue of two hundred and twenty five thousand and the lender allowed me to use the full two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars whereas their bank said no forget it even their business bank said no um, and their main bank so they said you made zero dollars so uh, we were definitely able to look outside of uh, beyond the bank for that and then finally private lending private lending is pretty much purely equity based um, it is higher fees for sure uh, and there is a lender and a broker fee involved with that but private lending is really good when uh, you've got you know a, a large amount of equity in a home and you maybe want to take some equity out whether it's for investment purposes uh, purchasing another property uh, sometimes you can do you know a first and a second loan if you are a little bit more of a sophisticated investor I definitely suggest with private lending um, that you use a, a, a an above board mortgage broker like myself my job is to make sure that you have an exit strategy it's short term it's again to get you in and then to be able to get you out in some way or other as I've said get in and get out uh, private lending should not be a long-term strategy so finally here are my details thank you so much I'm introducing Gary Wong so definitely one of my top realtors realtor extraordinaire here in Vancouver and he is going to be talking about how you can build a portfolio of real estate please put your hands together for him now okay my name is Gary Wong and thank you Jordan for uh, presenting on how to borrow I'm gonna be talking about how to buy so how to build a real estate portfolio that takes care of you. Uh, many, some of you know me, but uh, many of you don't. So just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Gary Wong. I've been a realtor since 2012. I did my MBA uh, prior to that. Uh, I have, yeah, I've sold over $109 million in real estate. I have a YouTube channel um, that has almost 500 videos now. Uh, I'm the author of the book on Vancouver Real Estate and all of you ha uh, are eligible to get a free copy, either the English version or the Chinese version, uh, which was recently translated. I was one of the directors of the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver in 2017, 2018. I created the luxury home sales system. I founded the real estate acquisition formula and I've been an award-winning realtor since 2013. Okay. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to build a real estate portfolio and why and how. So this is the agenda. First thing, um, people ask me why, why is it so important? Why is it so important to build a real estate portfolio? Well, when my clients come to me, one of the first questions I ask them is, uh, your family income, does it make less than $200,000 a year? If yes, you need to build a real estate portfolio. Uh, I just Googled this inflation chart after 20 years, your $100 at 2.5% inflation will be worth $68 in 20 years. After 3% inflation, it'll be worth $55. After 30 years, your $100 will be worth $55 at 2.5% inflation. After uh, if 3% inflation, it'll be worth $40. So I'm pretty conservative. So I talk to my clients and I say, hey, if you're making $100,000, it'll be worth $40,000 of purchasing power in 30 years. So it's really important that you have ulterior, alternative streams of income to make sure you can retire comfortably. Retirement plan, I'm a real estate agent, of course, so I am biased towards real estate. Stocks, I, I've tried it before, but I'm not an expert. I think that stocks, you don't have much control. If you are into stocks, do your due diligence. If you study stocks and you're expert at stocks, I know a lot of high, uh, ultra high net worth individuals who invest in stocks, but I per se, uh, for me, real estate is where to go. Bonds, market volatility, when interest rates go up, bonds go down, when interest rates go down, bonds go up. So I'm not a favor, uh, a fan of bonds. Gold and silver, there's no yield in per se, like dividend yield. There's a market volatility and there's, you don't get to take advantage of the capital gains tax exemption, like real estate. Businesses, 
unless you're 100% sure you can sell your business, uh, businesses is a little bit risky because 80 to 90 percent of businesses never get sold. I know quite a few friends of mine who own businesses and they're trying to sell them and it's really tough to sell those. The golden goose versus the golden egg. Many of you know the story but the story is a farmer had a goose that laid eggs that were made of gold. So this farmer took the eggs and they sold them for a large profit. And then what happened was uh, he kept on getting these, uh, these golden eggs and he thought, hmm, maybe inside the golden goose there are a bunch, a, store, a storehouse of golden eggs. So maybe I should kill this golden goose and open it up. So like in the comic where the man in the red shirt says, these investment geese we got are wonderful. How's yours? And the man in the blue shirt says, hmm, delicious. He actually killed his golden goose. So this is the case where many of my clients, uh, they, they bought a real estate property, bought a home, uh, bought a condo or something, a pre-sale, and they try to flip it. They sold it for a profit and they keep doing that. They buy, flip, buy, flip. And the problem I have with that is I've talked to a lot of different people and most people <coughs> like they take the profit and they don't reinvest it. Most of them, they actually buy, they sell, they make a profit, make $100,000, $200,000, and then that money just gets spent on vacations or luxury items or a lifestyle. And then that, that uh, golden egg, or they basically cold, killed the golden goose and then that profit, they just like dumped it on, wasted it on stuff. So how many of you here have bought and sold real estate? Put up your hand. So most of you, how many of you have bought and sold real estate and the profit, you invested it immediately? All of it. Okay, less of you. But most people that I've spoken with, they are not able to invest in it. They, they make a $200,000 gain on a pre-sale assignment flip and they spend that money. Oh, well, I, sh I should pay off some debt. I should pay off some some uh, loans, I should buy a vacation, like I should go on a vacation, I should buy a luxury car. And they usually spend that money. And so they actually killed the golden goose and they took the profit immediately, but it didn't sustain them for their, it didn't help them for their retirement plan. So that's where it goes to the single versus multiple properties. I help my clients get one golden goose, one property, and then I tell them, that's not enough for retirement. When the tenant pays off the mortgage, that $1,000, $2,000, that's not gonna uh, sustain your retirement. So you gotta buy multiple properties. You gotta buy the first golden goose, and then you gotta hold it. Then you buy your second, your third, and fourth, and so forth. Liquidity is one reason why I like uh, real estate. Obviously, when I work with my clients, I tell them to buy in great locations which have a high demand for rentals also a high demand for buyers in general that are easily like resellable. So I don't suggest like leasehold properties. I don't suggest like uh, properties in like areas that nobody knows about. I suggest very solid investments. Okay, so four simple steps to how. Goal setting, dream team, strategize, action, and tweak and repeat. It's pretty simple, but when I work with my clients, the first thing I do is sit down and have a buyer's consultation. I sit down with them and I talk to them about what their decision, um, what are their goals. But first, who are the decision makers? So if the decision makers are the parents, am I sitting in front of the parents? If I'm just sitting in front of the, the client, but the parents are the decision makers, I want to get them into the conversation. Is the spouse a decision maker? Are the children decision makers? That's important. Number two, short-term and long-term. Are they buying for a short-term goal? Are they buying for a long-term, like 10, 15, 20 years? I ask them usually, what's their 10-year goal? What's their 20-year goal? What do they want to do? And then once they tell me, then I can reverse engineer that. Some of my clients come to me and go, Gary, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I, I want to retire when I'm 70 years old and I want to own just two properties in my life. I'm like, okay. Totally different from the client who comes up to me and says, Gary, I want to own 20 properties in my life, right? 
Same thing, comfort versus investment. I talk to them, what are you buying this property for? Is it for comfort? Is it for investment? They're like, oh, well, investment. Okay, great. What does that mean? Cash flow or asset appreciation? Well, what does that mean? And then I ask them questions and I dive deeper in figuring out what exactly they're looking for. How much, they, how much money do they need to retire? I also calculate that and ask them whether they want to retire wealthy or retire poor. Dream team, this is the how. So I am a key part of that picture, but I'm not the only person. So I have a dream team with me. I have a mortgage broker, I have an accountant, a lawyer, a contractor. If you have rental properties, you want to make sure you have a reliable contractor to take care of the property. If there are any repairs, insurance agent in, uh, for my clients, I care about um, kind of, I care about my clients for like holistically. So are they taken care of um, holistically if they die, if they have critical illness or something like that? So insurance agent, a property manager is a must, of course. Uh, they can choose to rent out their property themselves or choose to hire a property manager. Usually I tell my clients, first couple of properties, if you have the time, rent it out yourself, learn the ropes. And then when you have like over three properties, then you can choose to uh, get a property manager to leverage your time. Next step, strategize in action. Basically, when I sit down with them, we have that conversation, we narrow down the search, we go on buyer tours, we write offers, we do our homework, and then we buy the property. Pretty simple. And then we tweak and repeat. We basically see, okay, you've bought your first property. Okay, how are we gonna buy your second property now? Do you have the money? Do you have the income to? Well, I don't, Gary. Okay, how are we gonna increase that income? And then I have different options and ideas for them to increase their income. We talk about whether they're gonna do it themselves regarding property management, or whether they should hire a property, management, property manager. So this is my real estate acquisition formula. It's on my website. Basically, we go through uh, strategize, identify, analyze, negotiate, manage. Strategize is what I talked about. We talk about their budget. Uh, we make sure they talk with their mortgage professional and I talk with their mortgage professional. Uh, many of my clients go through Jordan. So I talk with Jordan, hey Jordan, okay, based on this uh, client, what can they buy? And then we go from there. We also talk about in the buyer's consultation, asset appreciation versus cash flow, their long-term goals, et cetera. And then second step, identify, we narrow down based on my questions. I, I, um, based on my questions, I will a, I'm able to narrow down exactly what works for them. Based on their preferences, I know which neighborhood is good and which neighborhood doesn't fit them, which property type works for them and which don't. Then analyze. I basically go through a SWOT analysis. I don't tell my clients I'm going through a SWOT analysis, but I'm telling them, okay, let uh, what are the pros, cons, some opportunities, some potential, like is this area going to be rezoned later, uh, what's going on in the community plan. So I go through a SWOT analysis in my mind and I basically convey it to my clients uh, in language that they can understand. Negotiate, we talk about win-win terms and conditions. Uh, sometimes it's good to go through, go uh, with a full subject, uh, subject offer. Sometimes it's good to go through go with a subject free offer obviously you don't just randomly do it you have to speak with their financing professional you speak to uh, i find out about their risk tolerance and what works for them that's negotiation manage they buy the property we talk about property management we talk about tax saving strategies do they have an accountant that they're working with then we talk about exit strategy Okay, so you have this property, are you gonna hold it for the long run? I suggest you hold it for a long run, but if they wanna flip it in order to upsize to a house later, then maybe that could be part of the conversation. So exit strategy to maximize ROI, and the last step, rinse and repeat, repeat. That's it, that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, ask at the end of our presentation. Also, you, each of you will get a copy of my book, uh, the Chinese or the English, whichever one, or if you want both. And for our next speaker, we have Adnan Sor Sorwar. Sorwar. He is the business monk that he calls himself. And he, I've worked with him, and he is like high performance. 
He gets stuff done. He's always on top of it. He helps people um, bulletproof their assets, bulletproof their homes specifically. So without further ado, let's bring up Adnan. So I'll get everybody to learn my name. <laughs> Anybody here have been to an Indian restaurant? Show of hands. Have you had naan bread? Indian restaurant? Can you add something to naan bread? So add naan, you got it? <laughs> and then my last name is actually Persian, right? Uh, it's actually a pronounced sarwar, right? Uh, means uh, either a big boss or a king. But uh, I uh, tend not to act like one, right? So. Uh, so my, uh, my background is um, I was an investment banker for Merrill Lynch in London for 10 years and then I've been in Canada for about 15, had a real estate business in Toronto for five years and in Vancouver, BC, um, have a wealth management practice for about 10 years as well. So been, I look young but <laughs> I have a, a bit of experience uh, around the world. And as an investment banker, people ask me, hey, do you actually invest money? And uh, what I would tell them, you know, I'm the best risk manager you can hire. I would manage your risk. You already have money. My clients were millionaires. Sometimes they were billionaires, multi-billionaires, some of the richest people in the world. And uh, they already had money. They made their money. They didn't need me to invest their money. They needed me to protect their asset, to protect their investments or protect their, um, their they have liabilities coming, coming at them, right, from all sides. So that's what we did as an investment manager, right, uh, investment banker. Uh, a risk manager, right? So that's, I would, I would call myself a risk manager. So my topic today is uh, how to protect your uh, real estate investment, right? So it's very important to, um, to understand how to do that. What's your most important asset? Reese, you're at the back. Is it your real estate? Is it your most important asset? Yeah. One of them. One of them? Good, good answer. He's a banker. <laughs> so uh, Matthew, what's your most important asset? income. That's right. Your ability to generate income. That's your most important asset. Even more uh, than your real estate, believe it or not, right? And, uh, and imagine um, you're building your home and uh, you've hired contractors to build your home, right? So, so I have Melissa, where's your, uh, where would a dream home be in Vancouver for you? Kitsilano. Kitsilano. Yeah, we're bang in Kitsilano. Fantastic. Beautiful day, right? Just across the water, just here? Okay, perfect. Okay, so you hired um, Ian here, right? You've hired Brian, right? You've hired me. You've hired um, Michael, right? Eva, right? We are all contractors. You paid us money. You paid us money to build your home. Yes? Yes. Paid us $100,000. We're building your home. But you have not given us any plan. We are building your home, though. Michael's so busy painting, right? Eva is doing interior decoration, right? And... Uh, Brian's, uh, you know, uh, flooring, I'm doing the carpeting, right? And then Ian's doing the, the glass work, right? We're building your dream home. We have no idea what we're building. I'll hire George. You, you need to hire George. <laughs> Fire all of us. <laughs> right? So, um, so that's what's happening to people's finances. Does that make sense? They go to the banker for something, the investment guy for something, the insurance guy for something, the mortgage broker, the, the realtor, the... You know, you name it, there's a, there's a person selling you something, right? And uh, everybody's going to all these different contractors uh, with their finances, and none of them have a retirement plan. Does that make sense? 95% of Canadians cannot retire at age 65. These are statistics as of today. I actually met a government minister in a social meeting, asked him point blank, this is a first world country, Canada, how come 95% of your population cannot retire? What's going on here? You know what he said? Is this conversation offline? Are you recording me? I said, I said no, I'm not recording you, but please answer me. You're, I'm right here. I'm right in front of you. Give me the answer. He's like, you know, we're happy 95% of people cannot retire. That's what he said. So we are happy that they want to work until they die. So we don't have to pay for the retirement. Isn't that crazy? A government minister in the Canadian government told me that point blank. He said, are you recording me? I said, no. I mean, this felt like a horror movie. Right? It felt like I was in the plot of Get Out, right? So <laughs> I wanted to get out. It's like, what? Am I one of them? I don't want to be one of them. Does that make sense? So, and we live in, I call it the, the Hollywood of, uh, of Canada, right? We're, we're Hollywood, like we're all dressed like uh, James Bond, right? And then uh, Bond girls, right? So like, like Jordan here, she's a Bond girl, right? So you can see that, right? We live in Hollywood, California, right? So this is Hollywood. Hollywood. Um, 
a great saying by uh, Steve Jobs. I love that saying. He said, um, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get to heaven. Does that make sense? So, you know, we live in heaven, but we don't think about going to the next life, right? We think we're going to live forever, especially my parents. They're baby boomers, right? They, they, they act like or think like they will not go to the next life. I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than them, but I, al I already thought about it. Say, so, hey, what if I go? And Matthew and I uh, were in a road accident, um, you know, almost a year ago. And at the moment of impact, head-on collision, three questions came to my head. First question, is my wife going to be okay if I'm going right now? This is the end, you know, um, you know, is my wife going to be okay financially, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually? How is she going to be? Is she going to be okay? The answer came back. She's fine. You took care of her. You have a plan. You, you have a bulletproof plan. And I thought about my daughter. She's four years old at the time. How is my daughter going to be without a father? Is she going to be okay financially, mentally, physically, spiritually, like, uh, emotionally? Is she going to be okay without a dad? And again, I took care of her too, right? So the answer came back. And the third question came to me. In that split second, Matthew's right here, right? And uh, uh, the split second, uh, the third question was, are you ready to go? And of course, I said, no, this is not my time. My time is not up, right? This is not my time. But I took care of myself. I took care of my wife and my, my daughter that they'd be okay. So how many in the room have that kind of peace of mind with their finances? Good. Fantastic. I admire all of you. Right? And the, those who haven't, please come see when Matthew afterwards. <laughs> right? we, we will uh, definitely give you some, some peace of mind. Right? So, um, so, okay. A financial house. How does it work? Most Canadians, uh, Reese is here, the banker. Uh, most Canadians have, um, they've started their house. Uh, they're they, they, you know, build, building their house. The contractor is here. They, they have a house, right? And they have um, the registered retirement saving plan, right? I'm not uh, going to um, make an assumption that all of you know what that is. But in this house, you can see what's the, Jordan, what's the most important part of the house? Is it the roof? Are the, the walls or is it the, the foundation? foundation? The foundation of your house is your most important factor of building your house, right? So the foundation of any financial plan is actually life insurance. Guess what? Your banker doesn't do life insurance. Doesn't do it. I was at HSBC this morning. I was telling them, hey, I need a financial plan. You know, um, what if I get to this level, that level, right? They said, no, we don't have it. So I wanted everything in-house. We don't have it. Interesting, right? And, um, and there's a lawyer in the room. What happens if you pass away in Canada? You go to heaven without dying, right? As we talked about. Uh, and uh, you get to heaven and, uh, you know, what happens to your estate if you don't have a will? Um, there's intestacy rules. Perfect. It goes straight to the government. Goes to the government. Uh, How much are the taxes? Uh, probate fees. It's about, let's say, you have a million in assets. Yes. $14,000. Perfect. There you go. So, would you like your, Adrian, right? Would you like your government to be your biggest beneficiary? No. <laughs> sure. Positive? Positive. How about your banker? Let me show you the next one. Right? The RRSP. Let's say 100000 in your bank account, right? And then you're at the top of your uh, marginal tax rate, 48.7% in BC. Something would happen to you. You go to heaven to see Steve Jobs, right? 48700 out of your 100000 will go to your banker. Interesting, right? You would have had to make 47.8% to get your same dollar back. Does that make sense? How many have you? Sorry? 100% tax, that's what it means. 100% tax at your marginal tax rate. So if your tax rate is 48.7%, you're at the highest echelon of taxes, you would pay, your estate will pay 48.7% taxes. That's right. Does that make sense? So, so you've just lost a bunch of money on your home. You've lost half of your RSPs, half of your money in RSPs. Interesting. I told you, we live in La La Land. This is Hollywood, right? So nobody wants to talk about that. As if you, right? I'm sorry, without yes. a will. Without a will, without an estate plan, yes. Correct. Same with, the, with your stock market holdings, right? 50% is taxable. If you lost 50% in the market, Eva, is it actually 50%? Does it 
Does it take 50% to get your money back? It's actually 100%. You need to make 100% to get your 50% back. Interesting, right? So people don't think. People don't think. They just, you know, they're the Bitcoin guys. You gotta love the Bitcoin guys. <laughs> no Bitcoin guys tonight. <laughs> you know, this is about real estate. Um, I'll prove it to you in a story, right? How about I tell you in a story, then I can end my talk um, easily. But there are vehicles you can put your money in, which is 0% taxable. If something were to happen to you, 0%, you don't pay. There's a great book called uh, 10 Secrets Revenue Canada Does Not Want You to Know by David M. Watt. Please read it. It's like a 50-page book. It's, it's worth it, its weight in gold, right? It's unbelievable, right? 10 Secrets Revenue Canada Does Not Want You to Know. Right, David M. Watt. It's a, it's a national bestseller. So uh, the example I give you is uh, my wife is from Japan. She's Japanese. My wife's best friend is Japanese. She said, "Hey, Adnan, you work in uh, finance. Uh, what can I do uh, with my money?" Right, and um, I said, "Okay, how much money do you make?" She said, "I make three thousand dollars a month net after paying taxes." She's an employee. I said, "No problem. Uh, how much would you like to save without breaking the bank? Right, without feeling the pinch?" She said, oh, I can save 10% of this $3,000. So 10% of $3,000 is $300, which is, if you break it down again, it's just $10 a day. It's the money she was spending in Starbucks, eating out once a day, right, with her uh, colleagues. I said, okay, $300 out of $3,000, she can put away. $100 a month I put for life insurance. So if she were to pass away in, in Canada, she's from Japan, her parents don't speak English, they will have a tough time with the final remains, right? So $100 a month I put for critical illness and disability insurance and $100 for uh, a tax-free savings account in an investment bank earning 8 to 10%, right? So, um, so that's what I set up and I, I moved to t Vancouver. She lives in Toronto. One year later, she calls me. She said, I'm getting married. I'm having a baby. I said, great. Would you like to save more, save less? What's your plan? She said, no, no, I can still afford 300. I'm still working, right, full time. Uh, on my eighth month, right, uh, I may take mat leave, right, then we may have to adjust the, the plan. I said, sure, no problem, based on my income. Six months later, she calls me in the middle of the night here in Vancouver, three o'clock in the morning, pick up the phone, right, you know, when you're sleeping, in the middle of sleep, phone rings, you don't know if it's a, you're in a dream or if it's real, right, so I, I was in that, I was a little bit groggy, I pick up the phone, say, hey, Fusa, like, what's going on, it's three o'clock in the morning here. Uh, she, she said, oh, I'm so sorry, it's 6 o'clock in the morning in Toronto, right? Um, but um, I'm calling, this is an emergency. I said, what happened to you? Right? My first question, she used to be a big party girl. Uh, I said, are you drinking? Right? Uh, this is, you know, like uh, it's a Saturday morning, right? Uh, Saturday night probably. Uh, are you okay? Uh, you're pregnant, right? I said, yes. And um, the minute I mention her baby, she starts crying on the phone, like uncontrollably. She's crying and crying. For 10 minutes, she's crying, and I'm holding the phone, thinking the worst, like, did she have a miscarriage? Because how can you even ask that question, right? So I just let her cry out. I ask her, okay, you called me. I'm here. What happened? Tell me what happened. She says, I'm doing, I was doing pregnancy tests, like right? six-month pregnancy test. I found out I have leukemia. And it's terminal. I'm going to die within six months. Is there any way I can save my baby's life? Is there any way you can help me? And of course, I, I just, you know, I thought this is no longer a dream. This is real. So I go to the next room and I, and I go into, I took a course by Anthony Robbins, like some of you took it. Right? He, he taught us something called pattern interrupt. Like you interrupt somebody's pattern. Otherwise she would have kept crying, you know, for the next four or five hours, right? Uh, she couldn't stop crying. So I said, well, the, the, the bad news is you have cancer. And I said that the good news is you have cancer. Then she, of course she, you know, she got interrupted her, her pattern. She said, what do you mean good news I have cancer? I said, well, you have you're paying for critical illness insurance, guess what, your uh, critical illness will pay out. You just have to prove it to me that you have this cancer. I'll send the documents, right, make a claim, and uh, you, know, you will get paid out. She's like, $100 I'm paying, how much money I'm gonna keep, get paid back? She doesn't even remember uh, her plan because she's in so much shock, right, uh, with the cancer, with the baby in her stomach. Uh, I said, well, believe it or not, it's $100,000. That's two years worth your income tax-free that you will get paid out. And she's like, what's the guarantee I would get? I was like, well, send me the documents. I'll do my best. And Matthew and I can say that we go to lots of events where we meet the senior people in those companies. I actually happened to meet the vice president of that 
insurance company in one of the, our events. I had his card. I called him point blank. I said, hey, man, uh, you are, um, we insured your client, right? But guess what? There's a baby involved, and we haven't insured the baby. The baby's still in the stomach. Baby, ha baby has to be out of the stomach seven days, right? Then we can insure the baby. So that was the as an insurance company rule. Like, what are you going to do about this? Like, I'm sure you don't want to get into some legal uh, hassles with this, right? And, and the guy was like, I can't talk to you anymore. Let me talk to my lawyers. Let me talk to my, like, let me see what I can do, right? Um, and within an hour, he called me back. Guess what? We'll pay out your client uh, the claim within three business days. Normally, it takes 30 business days to, uh, to, to make a claim, right? So, so definitely, uh, she was paid out. With that uh, money, she was able to get cancer treatment for bone marrow transplant. She got blood transfusion and she did chemotherapy for six months. Six months later, she called me and uh, she said, I'm still alive, baby's still alive, and nobody has cancer. Thank you very much. Like she called me an angel. I was like, I'm not an angel, I'm a human being, just doing my job. Right? And a few days later, um, um, my, my wife gets a call from Toronto from another person, another friend of hers. And, um, and she's crying on the phone. I say, what happened? She's like, you remember you spoke to Fusa a few days ago? I say, yeah, she's still alive. Baby's still alive. How are they doing? She said, guess what? Uh, she actually passed away from pneumonia. So imagine that. She was saving $300. Reese, what is $300 in the bank? Zero percent? Zero percent. Let's be honest. <laughs> right? $300 in a bank account is just $300. If she passed away, her family would have get $300 minus the, the debt taxes. Does that make sense? $300 in that financial plan, the first $100 was $100,000 tax-free. Second $100 was $6,000 from the investment money, tax-free, to the little baby girl and the husband. And when she passed away, the life insurance, we paid another $500,000 tax-free. That's $606,000 we paid out to that family. That's in incredible, right? You know, in real money terms, I calculated it. She, she paid in for two, two years. So $300 a month, two years, about 24 months, right? Um, at $7,200 in total. And she got paid out, what, 606? That's an 8,415% rate of return on your money. So it's not money per se, it's what do you do with it? How can you maximize the value of what you have? Does that make sense? That's how you can bulletproof your, your, your financial house. So I hope, um, you know, if you have questions, you can come see me and Matthew is here, right? Uh, you know, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. But that's a solid, would you say that was a solid financial plan? Would you, would you say that I impacted her family in a positive way as a new immigrant? Like sometimes, you know, I get uh, told by, oh, you don't know anything. I'm like, you're brand new here. I was like, well, I may not know anything, but some things I do understand. And the thing I understand, I understand it really well. And I understand, I, do, I, do, I don't do exciting things that don't work. I do boring things that do. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's really boring. My job is boring. It's just, my business is boring. It's just the most boring business in the world. But it works. And it helps families. Does that make sense? So I what hope I... The baby? Sorry? What happened to the baby? Baby's still alive. She's the first... In my phone, the first picture I have on my, in my phone is not my own baby, it's her baby. Yeah, her baby. Baby's still alive. It's got a weak heart, actually. So with the 606000 the husband is able to retire at age 30. He put it back in the investment bank, gets a 10% interest on it. So he gets $60,000 per year for the rest of his life. He looks after the baby full time. He doesn't, he doesn't go to work. That's my, my, my story about bulletproofing your, your financial <coughs> house, right? Let me introduce my friend. Um, he's actually one of my friends, also one of my mentors, right? Somebody I look up to. Uh, I speak highly of George, right? Uh, he's an, an incredible human being. Uh, his wife is here at the back, right? And uh, we, are, we are all here to support George. So please help me welcome George Wardulaga. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's presentation on interior design. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about five ways that you can create a beautiful home that's customized to suit your own tastes and unique preferences. So I own a company called Flowform Design Group Limited that's been around for 18 years. We help people 
do kitchen and bathroom renovations uh, w with either general contractors that we recommend or we've used before or with general con contractors, uh, excuse me, that they would like us to partner with. So um, for people who don't need these services, we help them fill their lovely new space that they've purchased, which is empty, with new furniture, new lighting, new uh, accessories, art, greenery. And we also help them uh, pick new wall colors and new flooring materials. We've been featured in the Vancouver Sun, the Globe and Mail, and in a book called Spectacular Homes of Western Canada. Now this coffee table book uh, features the most active and in-demand interior design professionals in this part of the world. And actually I'm going to raffle off one of these, uh, retail value is 50 bucks, to one of you lucky attendees. Uh, last but not least, uh, we like to work with repeat customers. These are people who have come to us three or more times who seek our expertise so that they can do well done renovation or simply a redecorating job so that they can redecorate their space properly. Okay, so um, why should you hire an interior design professional? Well, we help people stay together. <laughs> One of the interesting things that you may want to uh, learn is that couples who undergo some time of home, home improvement project, 12% uh, of them actually actively consider divorce. So how many of you have undergone some kind of bathroom or kitchen renovation before? Right? Okay. A lot of you. So you probably remember how that went, right? So th three things usually happen. There's a stress, there's disruption, and there's divisiveness. So stress, let's talk about that. So uh, you may not always you know, agree with each other. So that leads to a lot of tense and often heated discussions, especially since you have to make several hundred, if not thousands of small and large decisions that involve money. And then disruption, if you recall, the uh, demolition. That generates a lot of dust, a lot of uh, debris, a lot of noise, not to mention people that you don't know coming in and out of your home for several weeks if not months, right? And then how would you like to not be able to use your one and only kitchen and maybe your one and only bathroom if you live in a one bedroom? I remember many years ago when my wife and I used to live in a one bedroom apartment, when we renovated our bathroom we had to borrow our next door neighbor's toilet for the better part of two weeks. Imagine having a knock on the door, can I please borrow your washroom? That is a pain in the butt, right? as you can imagine. So uh, third is divisiveness. You and the rest of your family or your partner may not have the same tastes uh, with regards to furniture or color. You might want, for example, something more contemporary while your counterpart might something want something more classical or traditional. Or they may want some neutral colors, while you might want bright colors and even wallpaper that no one wants. So how do you bring two people together uh, who are on opposing sides you know, of uh, the spectrum to agree? Well, just call them, call a third party, uh, detached person such as an interior design professional so that you can both get on the same page and move forward. I've come across so many people who uh, after two years the living room and dining room the entire first floor is empty because they can't decide. Then I came in two weeks later we're off and running. It's that simple it's that easy. Okay so I get this question a lot. George if I invest in a good reno or redecorate my home, how much appreciation will I get? Well, according to Bloomberg News, you can get as much as 12%, 12.5% or more in home appreciation if you do a home reno or a redecorating job properly. And more and more, I come across this scenario, people coming up to me and saying, hey, George, you know, after we renovated our pl place, we put it back on the market and we sold it in less than a month. Whereas our neighbor, you know, it's really odd. They had the same floor plan as us. They lived on a different floor. 
it took them half a year to sell their place. On top of which, they had to lower down the price of their home several times until when they eventually sold it, it was at least 10% less than our place. So how is it that some people can sell their home for more, faster, while some homeowners struggle? Well, the, question, uh, the answer is good design. So what does good design look like? So imagine coming home to a beautifully designed space that makes you want to relax the minute you come in. Imagine uh, preparing food in a kitchen that inspires you to cook great tasting and nutritious meals. Imagine having breakfast or brunch in a space like this that makes that promotes uh, good conversation, laughter, and inspires good memories with people that matter to you. Imagine sleeping in a room that's not unlike a boutique hotel that you've stayed somewhere. And on top of which, encourages you to dream sweet dreams. Last but not least, imagine taking you know, a shower in a bathroom that transports you somewhere else, like a five-star resort. So all of this is possible in your space if you are an interior designer that's experienced and capable. So let me share with you five ideas to help you create a space that's good looking and works for you. So one, uh, think about your goals. Is this gonna be a temporary situation for you? Like you're gonna put it back on the market for five years or less, and then maybe, or maybe rent it out? Or is this more like a forever space where you're thinking of staying 15 to 20 years or more? Thinking about those things will help you decide what kind of quality of uh, furniture or materials to install, you know, what your timeline is for the renovation, and even budget. Second, think about time and how much hassle you're willing to go through. So one home that I'm working on in Yale Town right now, it's 2,700 square feet. It's spread over th three floors. It's got three beds and three and a half bathrooms. It's pretty massive, uh, but it's just a giant condo downtown. So the permitting on that took two to three months alone. Th that's not a hassle because that happens in the background. But the actual demolition, renovation, installation, moving of the furniture, that's five to six months. So are you willing to subject yourselves to five to six months of inconvenience? Or is it more three to four months? Or maybe two months or less? If it's just furniture that you're buying, you move into a new empty space and there's no renovation involved, then certainly that's a lot faster. But if you're gutting everything, tearing out cabinets, bathrooms and stuff, that takes longer. So it might not hurt for you to think about, well, maybe during the demolition phase, uh, I might stay with my friend or my parents. That way, you get a better chance of saving your relationship and your sanity. Living through a renovation is really tough. And if some of you remember that or have seen someone and then there's work going on next door and you're sleeping in, a, in the room next door, that's really hard. So you may want to think about that. Third, decide on budget. How many of you go to a car dealership without a budget? Anyone here? No one, right? We all go to a car dealership. We know how much we're going to spend, how much car we're going to buy. In the same manner, you might want to sit down with an interior design professional with a number in mind. Is it more like 200, 250,000 and up? Is it more like 100 to 150,000? or maybe seventy dollars to $80,000 or less. Having that number in mind will give us a sense of, oh, okay, uh, this is what's possible with your budget. We can do it all at once, or maybe we can phase it. Like, let's do one part in six months and then the second part later on. Or you might realize, oh, this is not enough. Or maybe this is more than enough. The important thing is to come to a meeting prepared with a number and not like what most people do is they try to get the number from us, from a general contractor. So they get three numbers. One general contractor will say, this costs 80000 Second one will say, this costs 150. dollars The third one will say, this costs 300000 And then you get the middle number. Not knowing really, what am I getting for that middle number? Whereas if you call a designer in, we can draw it out on CAD, 
even do renderings if you require, then you know what you're getting. You see it. There's a floor plan. There's elevations. Ah, OK. And then we can just have several general contractors price that out. And then we know, or you know, what you're going to get. Fourth, and this is key, create a folio of images. So whether you gather some magazines or books, cut, and then put it in a binder, that, and then you can set aside, or just simply open a Word document, call it My Dream Space, and cut and paste images from the internet, then again, with that proverbial meeting with a designer, we can get some direction as where you want to go. We can see, ah, oh, OK, yeah, I see what you're getting at, rather than us trying to guess stylistically what it is that you want. So get some images of spaces, you know, living, dining, kitchen, bathroom, colors, finishes, that kind of fit your preference or your family's. Then show it to us. Then we can understand better what to do uh, with the project that we're looking at. <coughs> Last but not least, talk to an interior designer. So ask people who've worked with a designer before that they're happy with to recommend some names. And then once you get a name, look at their portfolio online, look at any reviews that are on their website, and then sit down with them. Share a portfolio of images, share your budget, share your timeline, and then you'll have a more productive meeting and be able to decide, OK, I think we can do this. We can do this now or in three months. Or, oh, I think uh, this is a project for next year. Rather than trying to talk to several and trying to figure out what you want, come to the meeting knowing what you want and then finding out if the person in front of you can achieve your dream space. So that concludes my talk. Thank you, everyone. Questions and answers. Any Q and A for anybody? For anybody? Yes. For Jordan. Jordan. Uh, you had mentioned that that five hundred dollars for that car payment was a problem. Yeah. So what strategy do you normally employ on that? To sell the car. <laughs> really good question. I like I like what this woman is saying. Um, somebody else mentioned sell the car. Absolutely, that the um, yeah, those lease payments. The the car is it's uh, it definitely takes a chunk out of that mortgage qualification amount. So where did that lady go? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, you can. There are a couple of creative ways that you can make it not show up. Sometimes, unfortunately, if it is coming up close to being finished. We'll take some of the down payment and put it towards the paying out the car lease because it actually certainly works out in your favor. Do you have one of those creative ideas for us on the car lease payment? In and around the car business for close to 20 years, um, a lot of I guess, larger groups or even independent leasing companies could do a corporate lease or even an in-house lease that wouldn't report so that that car wouldn't exist. That's right, yeah. Um, if it does show up on the credit report, even if your uh, it, company is paying for it, your corporation, sometimes they get a little bit sticky about that and they say, well, it's showing up on your credit report. So it, it is good to know that there are some creative ways that we can uh, work around that. And sometimes it, whether it's paying it off or using some of the down payment or h hiding it <laughs> is, uh, is possible. Yes. Yeah. For your client with the income of 235, the corporate income of 200. The 225,000 net. Yep. How much was he or she pre-approved pre for? Uh, she herself, uh, that was a very, very difficult case. There were three people on the uh, mortgage application. We had to include uh, several different loans, shelter costs, and in her case, we did, you know, $150,000. However, I mean, I could certainly with kind of a rule of thumb, and I just want to say, guys, this is just a rule of thumb. If I can use an income of $225,000, one of the banks uh, that I do, it is a bank, it's not one of the big six banks that will use all that corporate income, 
you could look at approximately, if she didn't have a lot of monthly liabilities, the kind of the, the rule of thumb is four times your income, four to four and a half. So we're looking at, you know, 900000 uh, a million dollars, as long as you don't have a ton of other liabilities. But that I definitely have to say is we do have to know. Anybody else? Yes. You know, on that, uh, back to that corporate income, <laughs> how many years of T2s are required with NOAs on that mortgage application? We take the corporate income from two years of the financial, corporate financial statements. So the, the two most recent reporting years, hopefully they're like right now where we are expecting 2018 and 2017. Any other questions for me or anybody else? Yes. I'm wondering uh, if it would be possible to get one mortgage with, for instance, uh, two families? In that case, you would have to have all the applicants in the mortgage application. And yes, that is absolutely possible. Lots of mortgage questions. <laughs> it, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated for me too. So I, I appreciate that there are many questions. Any, anybody else? You mentioned that there's a lot of private, uh, private money out there right now. Uh, yeah, there are there are a lot of private lenders, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, mortgage investment corporations. Um, even some of the the larger lenders, like Blue For Blue Shore Financial, has a private lending arm. Um, there are also private investors. So my office and my colleagues, we will use uh, self-directed RRSPs and lend out our own money. And slightly lower rates, so and we underwrite it ourselves. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of private money out there. Life insurance companies part of that. I don't know that answer. I, it, when you mean life insurance companies, are they are they actively in the market as, as well? Not as private, but alternate lenders right now. Or, or see this is like Manulife or Equitable Bank. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, Manulife is actually the seventh largest bank now in Canada. Uh, one of the my preferred programs is called the Small Business Owner Program uh, in Manulife. Um, and it has one of those extended debt ratios that I can use. And then beyond that, it's a great program. Um, if you have a, a decent amount of net worth, I won't go into the formula right now, I can actually push uh, that ratio beyond 70%. No word of a lie. Um, I did one last year where the total debt servicing ratio, so all of this client's liabilities, was 153%. And before I submitted that, I, I seriously thought I must be making a mistake. But no, I was not. And he got his money. <laughs> I was like, woohoo! Can you believe it? He was sitting on some equity. Yes, yes. You want to have, you definitely want to have some net worth. Um, but some of that net worth can be within the subject property itself. Of course. And that's a great program. But again, when we talked about those government regulations, it used to be that you only needed to show $5,000 worth of employment income. 5000 Right? And if you had some net worth, it, I could get you the moon but they've now increased that to $25,000 of uh, two so years. So if I'm sitting on a holding company and I pay myself $25,000? Bingo. Yeah, and you've got, you know. And can that be dividend income or does it have to be point one? It can be dividend income, yes. Yeah. 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 It's great. And if you've got a couple of million, you've got a couple of homes, you, uh, it does max out at a million dollars, but it's great for that kind of, I don't want to say middle income earner, but you know, it's great for somebody with a decent income and they need six, seven hundred thousand dollars, eight hundred thousand dollars, yeah. I'll try not to go into too many details, sorry about that. Any other questions for me or anybody else? You know, if you have any more questions, please feel free to take my card or come and speak to me after. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I hope you enjoyed our talks and we look forward to chatting with you more. If you enjoyed it, please go on to uh, our Facebook and, and give us a, a review. and. 
uh, take, a, take a couple of photos and enjoy the scenery and thank you again.